Grace and peace be unto you from our Father and from the Lord Jesus the Christ. I'm your professor, Dr. Stephanie. Welcome to the Master's Touch Masterclass. Thank you for joining us today. You know, our goal in this class is to give you a firm foundation in the Word of God. May God bless you richly with his wisdom as your, your journey to establish yourself in Christ. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving in our hearts flowing through our lips. We exalt and praise you and your holy name. Lord, we thank you for the hearts and the minds that are hungering for you and your word and to know your will. We praise you for your Lord, for because you're our Lord and Savior. And we praise you because you've given us our Lord and Savior, your only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ. We thank you for his finished work on the cross on our behalf. Thank you, Lord, for revelation knowledge, your rhema word, the logos word, and the gift of utterance. Bless those that have ears to hear, Lord, as you impart wisdom through your word. In the name above all names, the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. My friends, did you come expecting to receive from God today? Well, if not, you won't receive anything from him. So you know what? Right now, elevate your expectation level, and you're going to come away with a greater revelation, a greater heart and mind connection, and a better understanding of God's word. You know, we enter deeply into the presence of God by soaking in worship. So soak with me right now and let the Holy Spirit enter in.
Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be wholly acceptable to you and continually glorify you. May my words be your words and your words be mine. In Jesus' name, amen. How do we get out of doubt? Hmm. How can we overcome the fears, worries, hurts, and doubts of life and have more faith? Well, immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and got him. You of little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? Matthew 14, verse 31. You know, the following scriptures, Matthew 14, 24 through 36, John 6, chapter 6, verses 16 through 24, and James 1, verses 5 through 8, tell us, yes, you can by faith. We have three passages that deal with storms, being tossed into the sea of life, and confusion dealing with issues of faith and doubt before a loving God who rescues us. After Jesus was interrupted from his needed rest and went to minister over 5,000 families teaching and feeding them, uh, he sent them on to continue their lives and put into practice what they had learned. Now, we're not told what the long-term effects were on those people who were so eager to find and follow Jesus and to be fed by him. I mean, did their life change? Did they become Christians after Jesus' resurrection, adding to the church? Or did they just go back to their lives with a great story to tell, but with no impact, no application, and no real meaning? Well, Jesus then returned to his rest and his much-needed solitude with the Father. He sent the disciples across the lake. He'd make his way to them later. Then a storm came to upset their will and their faith. And just like we face in our lives today, storms of life. So the question is, will we learn and grow from it or be turned back? Will our lives be character-driven and glorifying to Christ? Or will they be sent careening out of control and smashed into anger and bitterness? We need to recognize that we live in a sin-infested world, folks. That gives birth to our storms. Life is not perfect and is certainly not fair. Life rarely seems to make any sense. And yet we also need to realize that we do need, indeed, we do, indeed, have a God who is there and who cares. As Christians, we also need to know that in our journey for of life, storms are going to come as storms always do. Either you're in a storm, coming out of a storm, in the middle of the eye of the storm, or surrounded by a storm even when you're not seeing it. You see, we all experience rough times, either because of our disobedience or because of the effect of the misdeeds of others on us. Since most of humanity is interconnected by just two or three degrees of separation, all actions and decisions do what? They affect others, either for the good or for the bad. And, and most often, people don't even realize that their actions have an impact on everybody else that's around them. But even in the storms of bad choices and sin or the fallout from others, Christ is the one who takes us to the shore. Now, during the, our sojourn and the tyranny of life's urgent matters, we will have times of waiting, times of confusion, when nothing seems to happen. Mixed in with times where people and pressure converge, creating stress that we may never have faced before. We end up thinking that Jesus has left us. Well, I mean, that's the way the disciples must have felt at times when Jesus went away to pray. After the feeding of the multitude, Jesus took a break. And as they waited, they wondered what was going on. Where was he? Where could he have been? Why was he not helping this crisis? <laughs> I mean, there had to have been such a high point, a great happening that couldn't be explained. An un unsolvable problem was solved. Yet, here came a storm, a gigantic storm of stress. Well, a storm from the weather conditions also sought to consume them as they crossed the lake. They faced a great physical as well as monumental faith challenge. The disciples must have wondered what had happened. I mean, they may have expected more miracles, a start of a new epic, an age, a, a great kingdom, which it was. Yet, they sped quickly from a pinnacle to the veritable highest of high points, all right, to such a low point, mentally, spiritually, and physically, both in geography, as in elevation, and in the measures of success in life and in ministry, just like many of us today, they plummeted down, down, down. It seems that Jesus sent them from the mountaintop to ex of a experience of joy into the major storm of fame, from fame to the threat of imminent danger. You know, Matthew 14, 26, or 24 through 36, and John 16, uh, 6, 16 through 24, John 6, 16 through 24. Uh, those are your evidence, okay? 
Just read those because it'll back up what I'm telling you. Then, in the middle of a dark night, a storm came up abruptly to toss the lake with such magnitude that it frightened even sea-hardened fishermen. Jesus went to the rescue of the disciples, cutting through the storm and literally walking on water to them. The disciples are astonished. Wouldn't you be? <laughs> they seem to have forgotten the impossible nature of their teacher, even right after such a magnificent miracle had just happened. You know, the feeding of the loaves and fishes, I mean, the multiplication of the loaves and fishes and feeding of over 5,000 people from having absolutely having zero to start with and then a couple of loaves and fishes to begin with. Once again, they left out faith <laughs> and they left out trust and they only saw their situation, the storm. Then they realized for a time that this was someone to be feared and worshipped. A fact that we too most often miss in our storm-tossed seasons. Just when all seemed lost, Jesus came on the scene. Like he always does. He literally walked on the water to them in the midst of a storm that they had uh, had them stuck in the middle of a lake, perhaps even facing death. We all face fame. We all face joy. We all also face threats and perils. And just when it seems that no one cares or is looking, ah! Jesus will come on the scene to rescue us. So here's the question. Did he ever leave? No. We have to see that Jesus doesn't leave or forsake us. He never left. He's here, always here, even when it's hard to see him. Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 5. But now, thus says the Lord, who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt for your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in your place. Since you were precious in my sight, you have been honored, and I have loved you. Therefore, I will give men for you and people for your life. Fear not, fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your descendants from the east and the gather them, gather you from the west. And we can plainly see here that we all need to be rescued. And the great news is that our Lord Jesus cuts through life's obstacles and miraculously intervenes in the storms of life. Hallelujah. Here he is. And he says to us, it is I. Do not be afraid. Because of our Christian faith, we have Jesus who rescues us. We have to see that we have been saved from our sins because of Christ. He reaches out to us. All we need to do is respond to him by taking his hand. Psalm 69. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no standing. I have come into deep waters where the floods overflow me. I am weary with my crying. My throat is dry. My eyes fail while I wait for my God. Those who hate me without a cause are more than the hairs of my head. They are mighty who would destroy me, being my enemies wrongfully. Though I have stolen nothing, I still must restore it. Oh God, you know my foolishness and my sins are not hidden from you. Let not those who wait for you, O oh Lord God of hosts, be ashamed because of me. Let not those who seek you be confounded because of me, O oh God of Israel. Because for your sake I have borne reproach. Shame has covered my face. I have become a stranger to my brothers and an alien to my mother's children. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. When I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, that became my reproach. I also made sackcloth of my garments. I, I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I'm the song of the drunkards. But as for me, my prayer is to you. O Lord, in the acceptable time, O God, in the multitude of your mercy, hear me in the truth of your salvation. Deliver me out of the mire, and let me not sink. Let me be delivered from those who hate me, and out of the deep waters. Let not the flood water overflow me, nor the, let the deep swallow me up, and let not the pit shut its mouth on me. Hear me, O Lord, for your loving kindness is good. Turn to me according to the multitude of your tender mercies, and do not hide your face from your servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily, 
Draw near to my soul and redeem it. Deliver me because of my enemies. You know my reproach, my shame, and my dishonor. My adversaries are all before you. Reproach has broken my heart, and I am full of heaviness. I looked for someone to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. They also gave me gall for my food, and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Let their table become a snare for them, and their well-being a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they, too, they do not see, and make their loins shake continually. Pour out your indignation upon them, and let your watchful, wrathful anger take hold of them. Let their dwelling place be desolate. Let no one live in their tents. For they persecute the ones who have struck, and talk of the grief of those who have wounded, that you have wounded. Add iniquity to their iniquity, and let them not come into your righteousness. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living, and not be written with the righteousness. But I am poor and sorrowful. Let your salvation, O God, set me up on high. I will praise the name of God with a song, and I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This also shall please the Lord better than an ox or bull, which has horns and hooves. The humble shall see this and be glad, and, and, and you who seek God, your hearts shall live. For the Lord hears the poor, and he does not despise his prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas, and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build the cities of Judah, they that, that they may dwell there and possess it. Also the descendants of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. What's Jesus telling us? Don't be afraid. Because we have a promise of God as well as freedom from fear, because our Lord is our partner in life and faith. Now this also means to keep the faith, to keep it going, hang in there, step up, and never give up. <laughs> this was a great comfort for the for people who were thinking of leaving the church in the early days of the first persecutions and, and for us in our confusing times. Our confidence is in Christ and not in situations or fears. So we need to encourage one another not to be afraid to put our confidence and trust in the Lord. This is also about the tests and trials of faith and thinking that both we and the disciples of old face. First, they were given a problem that humanly could not be solved, which was how to feed a multitude of people with no resources or with no means. We face a multitude of decisions each day. Here, they were going from being overly busy and popular to being alone and in dire danger. Likewise, we have ups and downs in our perception of our faith. Next, they faced a major decision. Would they commit to him or follow the noise of the crowd? The question Jesus gave them was, why did you doubt? I mean, all of that, and then he lays on him, why did you doubt? Then Jesus reached out his hand, and then they were willing to take him. Once the fears were gone, the disciples were willing to look to and trust in Jesus. This must be a beacon for us. I mean, so we're going to understand that we need to do away with our fears and frustrations and allow more room for Christ in our boat of life. I mean, this is a necessary step of faith, isn't it? I mean, it's easy to do when we can see. However, we usually can't see in a storm, right? We can't wait until it clears up. We have to step out and obey his precepts regardless of the weather or what others say. Regardless, regardless of what it looks like, what the situation looks like, it's swamping us, it's going to consume us. Don't let doubts and fears connect to the storm. What you need to look at is Jesus cutting across the storm so that you can see his hand. We must obey with joy. Matthew 14, verses 24 through 36, John 2, verse 5, and John 6, verses 16 through 24. There's your evidence. How did we get into doubt anyway? I mean, we experience doubt when we don't exercise our faith. We will be consumed with disbelief and distrust the opposites of God's call and plan for us. We will lose our trust and hope that God is in control. And when we do this, we will lose or miss out on seeing God come through with his promises. We will be, well, we'll be stuck in our fears and disappointments instead of seeking Christ, finding out what happened and what we can do to learn from it. I'll define this for you. Disappointments come from a collision between our expectations and experiences and ignoring the signposts of God prom God's promises. Now, this collision results in either a life wrecked by self-pity and resentment or one that can lead to triumph. The choice is ours, and the key to it all is where and to whom we look for our hope. 
This is about our circumstances and how we look at our Lord. How we see adversity and his sovereignty will totally affect how we learn and deal with it. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adver adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, that from God, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Philippians chapter 1 verses 29 or 27 through 30. Okay. Our unanchored stress now and disappointment along with the detachment from looking to God will take us away from seeing his signposts of precepts. As a result, we ignore God's plan and are dumped in the middle of a tempestuous sea. Job 23.10, Romans 5.3-5, and 1 Thessalonians 5.16-18. There's your evidence. Now, we can't just expect God to get us through without any effort on our part. To grow, we have to struggle and work it out, as we see in Philippians chapter 2. It's the struggle that helps us. That builds us and forms us. Without it, there's no growth. No real impacting faith, honest character, genuine patience, or maturity. You know, when, when you don't use your muscles, they atrophy. <laughs> and then you can't stand up. You can't walk. You can't move. When we don't rely on God, we're really neglecting ourselves because instead of helping him out, we're insulting him. We may not doubt who God is or the tenets of our faith if we're genuine Christians and have a real confession of faith. But we may, however, doubt his providence in our daily lives, and we're not alone. Yeah, you know, no, you're not alone either if you're struggling with this. James 1, 5 through 8 tells us that we are missing our target and misplacing our loyalty when we doubt. That is, we face, when we face hardships, I should say, it's like when we face, when we face hardships. Uh, what we should be doing is we should look through them so that we can see our Lord. But what do we do? And what do we tend to do? We just stare at the situation, become overwhelmed and frustrated, and then the doubts come and we begin yelling for help. We do the same with our loyalty as we cling to the circumstances instead of our Lord and Savior by looking into His Word and seeing what He says about us and the power and authority He has restored to us at the cross. See, James is addressing Christians who are relying on themselves and not really wholeheartedly seeking after God. We can become, as he states, double-minded and unstable, being unstable emotionally and in thoughts like a split personality or schizophrenia. We will be like a person who has two souls in conflict, two desires that can't be reconciled, and two masters who ask different things at the same time. I want my will and God's will. Well, this just can't be, my friends. Oh, it can't be. It won't be. It can also lead to doubts and cause us to be inconsistent in our faith and lifestyle, which is a form of hypocrisy, and it greatly uh, is, is greatly condemning by God. I mean, he condemned that. It's saying one thing and thinking or doing another, which also causes our indecision and being struck. Or not struck, but stuck. Maybe struck, too. <laughs> it's not being willing to make up your mind and go in the right direction. How can you be sure you're not... I mean, how can you be sure which way to go? You're unstable, right? But you should be able to make a decision and be sure that you're uh, of which direction to go because you're listening to the Holy Spirit and you're not unstable. Make your decisions based on God's values and not your ideas or indecisions. How do our decisions affect others? Well, how are they in <laughs> well? How are they relational and beneficial to others and to God's glory? I mean, let's be real. Being unstable may sound familiar. From my personal knowledge and understanding of God and His Word, and from my pastoral experiences, this is how most Christians live today. Jesus implores us to literally beg for wisdom because we are empty inside ourselves. If we don't seek wisdom, but remain in our own thinking, we will be untethered like a small boat without an anchor in a storm, tossed and tumbled in the waves of distress and the chaos of life. We will literally be unstable mentally, rationally, and spiritually without our Lord's direction. Now, I don't know about you, but in the past I've found myself in that sea of confusion well, quite a few times. 
and we as Christians need Christ and his wisdom to take us through all the avenues of life, especially through the hard times, times of darkness, stress, and suffering. If we don't seek him and his precepts, we will not have wisdom, and we will never learn from our mistakes and experiences. So we'll just repeat our mistakes and keep ourselves oppressed, steeped in our fears and setbacks, and we will never grow, and in fact, we may keep repeating the same mistakes again and again and again. How sad that would be to go through a tough time and not get anything out of it. It would be such a waste, an empty experience, void of meaning or benefit for us or for others around us. You see, without wisdom, we will never learn his precepts nor have his wisdom and help. We will not be infused with faith. Therefore, the ways of ourselves and the world will toss us around until we drown in anxiety and despair. Our life will have been a vapor that had little meaning or benefit, a life wasted instead of a life triumphant. What's the key? It's learning that our hope is in the Lord, not in our expectations. Psalm 25, 4 through 5, Mark 9, 17 through 27, John 16, verse 33, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10, 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 27, and Hebrews 12, 6 through 10. Evidence. So how do we get out of doubt? Well, this may sound trite and quip, but it's what we have to do, and when we do it, it works. We have to accept God's plan for our life and then ask for wisdom to deal with it. Now this means we don't seek what we think or want or what others who are less mature have to say it, say about us, but rather we are to seek God and his word to give us the knowledge to grow and to get through. God assures us that when we seek him, he will respond. When we ask for help and wisdom, Christ will give it to us. The key is to ask in faith be in prayer, and be trusting and faithful. This shows a confidence in God's power that without a doubt that he, he's there and he's going to help. Because if we doubt, we don't and won't have confidence, and we will be tossed by our struggles to the point that they may drown us. We must seek the help of wisdom, not just knowledge and information. Wisdom is practical spiritual insight from God's values and then application of his righteousness and truth. So we're to learn from this and be wise. Now be understanding, ask God for comprehension, his perspective, and then cooperate with him. This means not just asking why, but how we can learn and grow. It's also a response of being godly, how we can please God in character and maturity. James tells us to ask God, meaning to beg God passionately and with reverence, realizing that we are helpless and in great need. Now he's the source of wisdom, the only source and what we need, and he is the one we're to go to for all aspects of life, good times and bad. He will grant our request as long as it's sincere and in his will. If we don't trust and obey, but just rely on the feeble, misguided insights of others, we will be tossed. In other words, we will be unstable, immature, and weak in faith. We will remain in our fears, frozen in our self-made prison of misplaced desires, lust, sin, and misfortune. Oh, and yes, we are to seek the counsel of others, but from smart and godly people who, uh, not are, who are not our foolish friends and people whose lives are just as messed up as ours, or worse. We only become stabilized by pursuing the anchor of who Christ is in us. It comes down to what life is about, and life is about pleasing God, not pleasing oneself. It's about abandoning our desires and focusing on Him. His plan is far better than our desires. Ephesians 4, 14 through 16 tells us that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Wow, that's a mouthful. Again, life is about who Christ is and what he did for us and building our faith accordingly. With genuine, authentic faith, our objective and loyalty is Jesus Christ. He is what we hope for. He is what is to be seen. Faith is the promise of God that gives us the hope and confidence to receive, obey, act on, and trust God's promises because God's sovereign and trustworthy. You know what? Faith will help us perceive the world by, by what its potential is, not just by the suffering we experience and see. This helps us be implanted with hope. 
Now, we may not understand our problems or ever get a reason for them, as Job didn't. However, we can still trust in him who gives and saves, who loves us and is caring, uh, uh, caring us through all of it. Okay, do you accept his caring? It's sad how few Christians, when faced with problems, will really seek and rely on God. They tend to only see their situations cowering in bitterness and anger, even aiming that anger toward God. Now, they don't see that he is indeed in control, as 2 Corinthians 4, 7-12 through 12 tells us. Listen to it. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair, per persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then, death is working in us, but life in you. See, as a result of this misguided blame and anger, many Christians withdraw into isolation, into bitterness and denial, avoiding God's true love and plan for them. We have to learn to learn. We have to grow so that we can grow. If not, we stagnate and our circumstances will sink us. We have been given victory. That is what the Christian experience is all about. Our victory over sin and despair by what Christ has done on the cross on our behalf. If we don't declare the victory, we will only see defeat. Even though we already have the victory, we will be defeated. Doubts shouldn't derail us unless the Holy Spirit's telling us that we're going in the wrong direction. To know the difference, be in prayer. Take comfort. The impossible becomes the possible in Christ. Doubt will hinder you greatly in your service and growth in Christ, my friends. Doubt can actually cancel out your prayers and His work in you. We're not called to be perfect. How do we know? because he uses our weakness and failures. But doubt is like putting our shoes on backwards. We'll be uncomfortable, hurt, and we won't go very far. We have to see how much God loves and cares for us so that we don't even, <laughs> we won't doubt. We don't need doubt. Have sin and discouragement got you by the heel or the throat? Seek out if and why you doubt. Is there a good reason or are past experiences and fears hindering you? If you're stuck, then you have to take the initiative to reach out and accept God's hand. Allow him to lead you out. He won't forsake you. He'll be there. Don't try to swim by yourself because the current and the waters of life are too strong. The currents and tides of desires and wrong thinking and tempting opportunities will overwhelm you. Anticipate what may lie ahead and prepare. That's James' whole point. Unequivocally, we have to reach out for Christ and him only. We can choose not to be bitter, but rather be better. Know this. What we receive from God is good, and what we receive from ourselves and others will personal with personal agendas, I mean, come on, that they're not centered on God. They're bad and distract us from our growth. If we're being real with our spiritual information, we'll realize our need for Christ and his continual wisdom. Matthew 5, verse 3 tells us, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the key is to learn to take your life and your surroundings as they are, and then make every effort to build them to what they can be for God's glory. If our hearts and minds are divided between seeking God or seeking ourselves, we'll become double-minded and unstable. We'll become spiritually and emotionally unstable, bankrupt, and as a result, sink in the waves of stress in life. And we will literally be torn apart spiritually and physically by our stress and worry because we don't yield to Him. Let go. Let God. Let God al you know, allow your wholehearted devotion to be Christ, uh, be to Christ, and and not to yourself. Get yourself out of the way. God will not make your decisions for you. You need to seek his precepts and open yourself up to what is best for the sake and value of character. Then he will enable you to form and grow from it. Isaiah 26, 3 and Matthew 6, 33. Okay, what do I do when I'm overwhelmed? Ask God for help. He's able. Trust his control. You see... He's the God who can keep us walking above the waves and keep us alive and going when we're under them, when we're just under the tsunami, okay? Go through his words. Seek what you're supposed to learn. Find out from God where he is in the midst of your situation and circumstance. Ask him how you can get through and for his wisdom. If we don't learn, all those ways will just be a waste as they splash us into worry, anxiety, anger, and bitterness, even though we may keep going through them until we do learn. 
Don't escalate your situation, my friends, by complaining or distort it by denial, bitterness, or isolation. Don't be dumb, trapped in your own anger and regret. Be smart. Be a Christian who learns and grows and be committed to obedience, spiritual growth, and maturity. Instead of moaning, seek His grace to solve the situation. Don't blame or seek fault in others or yourself. Don't go there. Instead, get on with life and your commitment to Christ. Allow His amazing work in you. Resistance to God, bad attitudes, and anger only cause us more harm when we choose to be tossed by the seas of life without hope or without purpose. Let Christ be your anchor, or else you will drown, and your life will be a series of wasted opportunities. When you could have and should have grown, you will have squandered his call and put your energies into complaints and your mindsets and attitudes into bitterness and anger. We need to come to the point that we trust in the Lord regardless of how good or bad physical life is since it's temporary. <laughs> yeah, remember that. It's temporary. What we learn will be eternal. John 7, verses 17 through 18. Our relationship with God is not without its fears and distresses as it is with any relationship. We're in a world that's filled with distress and pain, and there is no way to walk through it without stumbling onto suffering and distress. You can see this in the psalm because David is angry. Being angry is okay as long as we don't sin or curse God in it. In Psalm 4, as well as many other places, he begs God to answer me. In our need, where do we go? We go to God. David does, you know, in boldness, as well as in humility and respect. We can't be bold before God without having reverence for him, and we can revere him while we're pouring out our heart, fears, and life to him. We can go to God with an imperative, passionate, pleading prayer that's brave and bold and courageous as long as we are also reverential. Real prayer means going to God in all times, good and bad, in all things, even in what you want to wear today. God will do right for the innocent, for those who suffer and are needy, and will act in his perfect time. And we can drop to our knees and still commune in passion and seek his mercy. Psalm 4 and Jeremiah 23 verse 6. See, it's easy to step out in faith when we can see, but in a storm we usually can't see, remember, and we simply can't wait until it clears up. We have to step out in that mess and obey his precepts regardless of the weather or what others are saying. Don't allow doubts and fears to join the storm and enhance it. See Jesus cut across the storm so that you can see his hand, then reach out and take it. We must obey with joy. Remember, our Lord intercedes for us. He comes to us and shows us the way of faith. And when we fail, he gives us his hand and places us where we need to be. The way to open this door so that he can work is to put our key of trust in the keyhole. He is the door with the keyhole. He gives us the key of faith to open his treasures and secures us through storms. John 2 verse 5. And if you know Christ, you have faith and you can get through anything. When we have the right relationship with God, we can have it with his people too, as he promises us his presence and guarantees us his victory. You see, God's character is perfect. He has no malice. He has no jealousy. That's wrong or misdirected. You know, he doesn't have any of that. God's not trying to get you or zap you, nor is he getting joy by making your life miserable. Rather, he loves you and he wants his best for you. Therefore, you can trust and be content in him. And when you pray to him, you can be honest. He already knows your plight, your fears, and your emotions anyway. He, we might as well let it out knowing that he's going to listen and have empathy and concern. 1 Corinthians 1-30 through 30. Jesus is the one who give, who's giving relief. He hears our appeals and he has mercy while we show our respect for his holiness. God promises us promises us that he will come to our rescue, but it won't always be when or for what we had hoped. Keep that in mind. His plan is best even when we don't see it. Psalm 25 verses 4 through 5, Isaiah 45 verse 13, and Jeremiah 23 verse 6. Did you receive this today? I pray that you did. If you have questions and further, need further assistance with understanding the message, contact me. Remember this wisdom Remember this, wisdom is the principal thing, so in all of your getting, get understanding, all right? And I cut that short. Wisdom is the principal thing, uh, so anyway, let's move on. Keep, Lord, keep Jesus the Lord of your life. I'm out of time. I've got to run. The Master's Word is a subsidiary of the Master's Touch Healing School of Ministry International. We're a 501c3 organization. Our website, themasterstouchhs.org themasterstouchhs.org. Email me, masterstouchhs at gmail.com, masterstouchhs at gmail.com. 
Uh, I want to invite you all to join Pastor Karen Weitzman and myself coming up right here at 10 o'clock Pacific Time for Living the Word. And uh, come join us following this broadcast every Monday at 10 a.m. right here, expecting to receive. Save the date, September 11th through September 15th. Join us for eCrusade 2017 right here on Spreaker.com. For more information, email masterstouchhs at gmail.com, masterstouchhs at gmail.com. Uh, two announcements. Join us for Bible study online tonight at 6 p.m. It's every Monday night at 6 p.m. We have uh, we have moved it from a two, to a two-hour program and from the two-hour program back to a one-hour program. So it's from 6 to 7 p.m. tonight. We have a unique Bible study. You'll love it. Come expecting to receive. Um, remember this. Uh, we're launching a new program uh, in the study with Jesus. And that starts Monday night, next Monday night, uh, the 12th of June on... Uh, uh, 7.30 p.m. to 9 p.m. here on Spreaker.com. Don't miss it. You'll love it. We're going to ask, you're going to ask questions and we're going to answer them. How's that? Wisdom is the principal thing. Then therefore get wisdom and in all of your getting, get understand, understanding. That's what we're doing here. Gaining God's wisdom. Keep Jesus Lord of your life, my friends. God bless you.